Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening, everyone. Welcome here in the Bali. And our working language tonight is English. And that's because we have our very dedicated guest here tonight, Giacomo Corneo, an Italian, originally Italian uh, uh, professor, but you're working in Berlin for a long time already. I'm going to introduce you a little bit longer um, within two, three minutes. But first, who has been born in 1989? Yeah. The year, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Empire, and also I think the moment Capitalism was declaring itself as the, the winner, as a, a social system, as an economical system. And in 2008, we saw the other side of the coin, when the crisis came up and everybody sort of suddenly realized that maybe other alternative systems were needed to, to, to well, to, 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 re, um, to re, uh, research in a way. And I think that's the moment you, as a professor of economics, started the debate. Why aren't we not researching other alternative systems? Um, I think in one of your uh, papers you mentioned the fact that, that you feel a little bit, that you feel sort of shyness in the scientific world to debate at all the fact that capitalism as a system is something which, he, which is not the only one. It's not the, uh, the only alternative. So we're very happy that you're here. You're a professor of public finance and social policy at the uh, Free University of Berlin. Um, you have done a lot of uh, international research and I think it's good to understand and also to know that you have been a very real European because you've studied in Milan and in Paris, but you've also, um, and maybe that's also important to tell, that you uh, studied at one of the Grand Ecoles, uh, the so-called Haute Ecole uh, in Paris for so social science. Um, and you worked uh, both in Paris and uh, over the last year in Berlin as a professor. Um, you wrote a book in 2017, and maybe who has been uh, reading it already? Okay, so let's see. <laughs> People are in a, a waiting modus. Um, the book is a sort of a debate between a father and a daughter. It's a sort of fictitious debate about the problems of our time, and indeed the question is capitalism solving these, these issues, is it addressing these issues, or is it simply not able to? Is capitalism obsolete, or maybe to say, is it done and over? Who thinks capitalism is done and over? Okay, that's about a small 10% of the audience. Well, let's see if the answer at the end of the evening is still the same. I, uh, I recognize some of you who have said that that system is done and over. So let's see what you will say at the end of the evening. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to present uh, by Giacomo the, the ideas behind the book and also the idea you find in the sort of last chapter where a lot of things come together but maybe can be the solution of uh, the future of capitalism or the adjustment of capitalism, of to maybe to a, a total new sort of thinking. And then we will debate those ideas further with the panel of three persons I'm going to introduce you at the time. We're very uh, uh, happy you're here all distinguished Dutch economical thinkers, financial thinkers. Um, so may I have a big applause for um, Giacomo. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here and uh, to uh, talk about uh, these ideas. Um, so the title of the book is, uh, Is Capitalism Obsolete? 
Uh, well, um, in Germany, many per persons uh, think uh, it is. So polls regularly find that more than half of the respondents claim that capitalism is not the best possible economic system for our times. And this despite the fact that Germany is a, a quite prosperous and fairly egalitarian economy. So why is capitalism so unpopular even there? Well, because uh, objectively, capitalism is inefficient, unjust, and alienating. So inefficient <clears throat> means that uh, this economic system wastes our scarce resources. Just think of mass unemployment, idle machineries, <clears throat> empty flats, and the abuse of the natural environment. Unjust means that the system distributes neither according uh, to merit nor according to needs. In order to realize this, just compare the living standard of an average person in uh, Europe with the one of an average person in Africa. And even in a country like uh, Germany, income inequality is hardly justifiable. Why should, uh, on average, an household on the top, person, on the top decile of the distribution have access to eight times as much income as an average household. Very difficult to justify. Alienating refers to work, which is a crucial part in the life of most people. Now, even in our societies, many workers feel to be exploited, develop burnout syndromes. Others, on the contrary, turn themselves into workaholics, which also impair quite severely their family lives and their social lives. So in the sum, uh, there are many compelling reasons why many people in our societies uh, long for a more humane, just, uh, and efficient uh, economic system. But the search for uh, alternatives uh, has been basically banned uh, in the public discourse over the last uh, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, as I mentioned uh, before. So nowadays, uh, and during the last three decades, uh, alternatives as are considered just dreams to be dealt with by science fiction authors uh, or gurus, hmm? so that this search is uh, relegated uh, clearly outside the political and scientific mainstream. I find that this uh, taboo is uh, an intellectual shame and also politically deleterious. It is an intellectual shame because if indeed capitalism is the best possible economic system for our times, then the statement should be liable to a logical proof, a clear argument. And if you are not able to deliver such an argument, then you are likely to learn something useful by considering alternative blueprints. So I think it is high time to look at a rational, in a rational way, without ideological blinders, to possible economic systems that differ from the current one. And this is why I, I wrote this book. So the book, uh, as uh, Leonard uh, said, uh, uh, starts indeed uh, with an email exchange between uh, a father and his uh, left-wing daughter. In this email exchange, uh, the daughter uh, harshly criticizes uh, capitalism, like I did before, and pledges for its demise. The father <clears throat> replies that uh, her conclusion seems to be premature because she has not dealt with the outside options. It could very well be that uh, even a highly imperfect system uh, like capitalism allows for no superior alternative. However, mankind during its long history has produced a number of interesting uh, alternative uh, blueprints. And the father would like to tell the daughter about uh, those blueprints. And then uh, there are 10 uh, inner chapters of the book in which uh, as many alternative uh, economic systems uh, are illustrated and uh, played through in uh, thought experiments. At the end of the book, the daughter and the father meet and uh, they jointly develop a possible evolutionary pathway towards a better economic system. So in those uh, 10 uh, internal chapters, uh, 
I try to assess whether a given alternative blueprint could deliver on average the same economic welfare or more than the current social market economy. So how can you assess whether a hypothetical, very complicated thing like an economic system could be feasible in that sense? Well, first of all, I should be a bit more clear about definitions. What is an economic system? An economic system is a, a collection of uh, rules that determine the production and consumption behavior of the members of the community so that society can materially reproduce itself over time. Capitalism is just one economic system, one in which the private property of the means of production and the markets are the two key economic institutions. The social market economy that I mentioned before is a variant of capitalism in which the government interferes with the market processes in order to reduce their inequality and uncertainty. So how can we assess the viability of alternative economic systems? Well, in general, economic systems must fulfill two fundamental functions in order to be viable. The first one is to motivate people, the members of the community, to accomplish the economic tasks that are assigned to them. I call this the cooperation problem of economic systems. The second one is to generate tasks that lead to a meaningful allocation of the scarce resources of a society, human talent, uh, existing capital goods, natural resources, land, and so on. This I call the allocation problem of economic systems. In order for an alternative economic system to be, considerable, to, to be considered a credible alternative to the current one, I think that uh, that alternative should be able to solve those two problems at least as well as the social market economy. Because alternatives that would lead to an economic collapse would never receive enough political support so that they can be implemented. That is the reason why I look at economic feasibility as a precondition for an alternative economic system. So for every given alternative blueprint, then I have to perform a double test whether it passes the cooperation and the allocation test. So the cooperation test means to check whether under the rule of that alternative system, people would be motivated to actively participate according to their skill in the production process and would be motivated to restrain their consumption activities so as to make them consistent with the overall resources that are existent in the given economy. With respect to the allocation problem, I have to check that the system generates tasks such that in the result, resources are not wasted or this is minimized so that as many needs as possible are satisfied. When performing this uh, double test, I always assume that every alternative economic system must work with humans as they are now. So people who are not completely selfish, but also are not angels. And especially man is not a blank slate on which you can write whichever motivation structure that you like. Otherwise, it would not be a fair game, giving us some alternatives, different humans, then of course they would win. Okay. So I start with this premise. And what are uh, the results, the key results uh, from, those, uh, from this journey through alternative uh, economic system. Well, first of all, I examine uh, a few fascinating uh, economic systems that uh, are based on a gift exchange logic. That is to say, they do not make appeal like capitalism to the material self-interest of uh, the members of the community, but uh, to their ability to feel empathy to behave in a solidaristic way. These are economic systems of common ownership. In those systems, there is no private ownership. Everything is in common. There is no money 
There are no markets. They are completely different. What are they? Well, first of all, Thomas More's utopia, described uh, more than 500 years ago, not so far away from here. And then the anarchistic communism that was uh, developed by Pyotr Kropotkin, a Russian uh, geographer, some 100 years ago. So in those systems, people donate their work to the community and are reciprocated by the gifts of others in forms of uh, goods and services produced thanks to the work of others. So the community as a whole decides how much should uh, we produce and uh, consume so that uh, it announces uh, production and consumption norms and the members of the community just abide by those norms. So for instance, when they enter those open warehouses where you can find everything that society has produced, they take away for their own consumption only those items that society deems to be the right ones for them. Okay? So in common wisdom has uh, those systems as uh, truly utopian ones. Mm? Common wisdom is that uh, those systems uh, would fail because uh, people would not donate. They would not comply with the rules of the uh, common ownership. Uh, they would uh, free ride on the work of others. Uh, and since everybody would do the same, uh, the economy would collapse. So in the terminology that I introduced just before, they would say that those systems fail to pass the first past the first part of the test, the cooperation test. I come to a rather different conclusion, namely that under some conditions, the cooperation problem could be solved also without private property and money. So what are the key conditions? The first one is that people should live their entire lives in relatively small communities where everybody knows everybody else which creates social control and social pressure that uh, you do not violate the norms of common ownership. Second condition is that uh, there should be quite an intense monitoring of the economic activities of uh, every member of the community in order to detect violations of the norms rapidly and to punish them so as to avoid that norm violation simply spreads like an epidemic in the overall society. The third fundamental condition is that uh, the polity, by means of uh, education and cultural uh, measures, uh, strengthens the moralism of people and their identification uh, with the collective. I think that those three conditions, uh, they are to some extent interchangeable, but in, on the whole, they are pretty hard restrictions uh, on uh, the personal freedom uh, that uh, we are used to know. So that uh, even people who are in principle uh, sympathetic to the ideas uh, of common ownership may not want to uh, have uh, those restrictions uh, in exchange for the alleged uh, advantages of this economic system. Independently of uh, what you think about uh, those restrictions, those systems fail to pass the second test, the allocation test. Hmm? The reason is that uh, those blueprints do not have any explicit coordination mechanism in order to allocate resources, hmm? to send resources uh, uh, to the various uh, sectors, uh, to the various regions, uh, to the various different products that are possible. Hmm? In those blueprints, uh, the allocation of resources is thought to be something that uh, will uh, uh, will establish itself out of tradition and uh, spontaneous agreements. So such a point of view could have been uh, meaningful in the 16th century in a stationary environment where the economic structure just repeated itself over centuries. But uh, in our times, in an economy with a dynamic uh, structure in which change uh, is uh, every day's uh, business. Such a, a failure to coordinate uh, alloca the allocation of resources would lead to a very rudimentary division of labor, hence to a slowdown of technical progress and uh, to a, an economic collapse. And that's why um, those systems 
as nice as they are, they are not credible. So the central planned economy could be thought as the attempt to solve the allocation problem that was left unsolved by the common ownership system. Because the central planned economy has a coordination device, namely the central plan. In the eyes of the socialists of the 19th century, it would have been the device according to, thanks to which humanity would have become master of its own destiny. Now, history has not been kind to this vision, but this is not a reason, a sufficient reason, for not looking at the possibility of a modernized version of central planning. First of all, central plan is a kind of central planning that, differently from real socialism, would be embedded in a democratic political system where you have competing parties that uh, propose to the electorate different plans. A planning economy that is a true planning economy that without, without money and markets. You know that uh, in the Soviet bloc, uh, money and markets uh, were used in order to allocate resources. Mm -hmm. And a central planned system in which uh, scientific methods of planning, uh, for instance, as developed by Nobel Prize winners in economics, could be used instead of the very, uh, very clientelistic bargained uh, planning uh, that uh, was typical of uh, Eastern Europe. So I examine also central planning, and they come also in this case, in the end, to a negative result, namely that uh, the Achilles heel of this system is again the allocation problem. Mm? In a very complex economy like ours, with huge product differentiation, with huge potential for innovation, introducing the institutions that are necessary in order to make central planning workable would create an enormous burden that would uh, delay structural change and over time would lead to an enormous gap with respect to the economic level of development of uh, capitalistic countries. And then I come to an important conclusion in the middle of the book, which is that uh, in order to solve uh, the cooperation and allocation problem in our times, some use of markets uh, is indispensable. Hmm? But this does not mean that uh, the search for alternatives uh, must be given up, because markets can be combined with non-capitalistic elements in order to create what I call hybrid systems. So in the second part of the book, I look for various hybrid economic systems. So what are they? First of all, the system of workers' self-management. Here we have, again, markets on which plenty of firms autonomously operate by buying and selling goods, but there is no capitalistic class. Those firms are in public ownership, and the machines and the means of production are delegated to the people who work with them, who are then master of their own production activities. By the same token, they are also the residual claimants of the net income of firms. I examine the system of market socialism. Here again, we have markets with firms in public ownership. There is no capitalistic class. Differently from the formal system, however, they are managed by professional executives who are responsible towards the government. And by the same token, the profits of those firms accrue to the government's budget that uh, can, for instance, finance a social dividend out of it. Then I examine two systems that uh, actually keep the defining elements of capitalism, private property in the means of production, and markets, but combine them with a third institution that is so far reaching that the nature of the system should change. What are those systems? Well, the idea of a guaranteed basic income and the so called stakeholder society. In the first case, every individual has a right to a monthly income that is high enough in order to fully integrate in the life of society. In the second case, everybody would receive upon entering adulthood, a starting capital that also enables this person to pursue her own uh, aims during life. And the idea behind both system, systems is that in this way, people would not have to sell their labor power in order to finance their livings, and hence would have the possibility to avoid the capitalistic uh, relationships uh, inside the production uh, the production uh, sphere and be emancipated from capitalistic uh, motives. Mm? 
Then I look also at a, a system that uh, I call shareholder socialism. I look at three variants of it, and I will come to it uh, in, a, in a moment. To make uh, a long story short, because uh, I do not want to run out of time, those uh, hybrid, hybrid system uh, actually fail also, in the end, uh, to pass the double test. <laughs> they fail to pass the double test, uh, with the exception of the shareholder socialism uh, model. I have no time to uh, explain or uh, to uh, refer to the reasons why I come to this claim, and I have to refer to the book. Um, I want now to use the last minutes in order to shortly describe shareholder socialism, because this is a new idea that has been mainly developed by economists over the last, uh, say, 20 years. Um, what is this alternative blueprint? First of all, in this system, it is a socialistic system, but uh, we have a private entrepreneurship. So small and medium-sized private firms uh, should thrive so that an entrepreneurial class can deliver this economy also the dynamism and flexibility that is necessary in order to have prosperity. However, and this is the huge difference, all large firms, all corporations are public firms and are also publicly quoted in a stock market. This is the key idea that differentiates this to, with respect to market socialism. So the stock market fulfills three fundamental uh, functions in this system. First of all, by sending signals, which are price changes in the shares that are um, traded in the stock market for of those public firms, it is possible to write incentive contracts for those public managers so that those firms are run in an efficient way. Big problem that we know from public firms in the past, in the Eastern Europe in the past. Secondly, it would also help to allocate investment in the overall economy, the stock market. Third, it would substantially dilute the power of the government. This is a big problem in all versions of socialism. The idea that the government becomes such a powerful actor because not only political, the political game, but also the economic game is under control of this actor. But in this blueprint, the stock market dilutes this power of the government. So what are the key uh, advantages of this system as compared to our own social market economy? Well, first of all, there is no more a capitalistic class that uh, being in control of the largest uh, conglomerates of the economy is also able and willing to exert a disproportional influence on the political decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it would avoid the danger that our democracy turns into a plutocracy. Second, the profits that nowadays accrue to a minority of capitalistic dynasties would accrue to the government that could uh, finance a social dividend out of it, so that every citizen would profit from, uh, from those uh, profits. <laughs> Thirdly, um, public ownership allows for a very far-reaching democratization of uh, the working conditions within each firm. That is to say, public ownership can be used in order to develop uh, workers' uh, voice, worker uh, participation within those big firms, and could also allow civil society to play a key role as watchdogs within those firms in order to control that fundamental issues like the protection of the natural environment, the protection of employees, the protection of customers, are indeed taken into account by the behavior of those firms. Okay? So these, I think, are very important advantages. On the negative side, of course, such a system requires quite a complex institution building where one should try to learn from experience by developing a, a clever governance structure, and uh, there are a lot of issues uh, that maybe we can uh, talk about in the, in the following discussion. But I think that it is a promising, uh, it is a promising uh, alternative uh, to capitalism that would, uh, of course, uh, contain inequality, 
Mm? Because uh, we know that uh, the labor share is uh, falling, uh, capital incomes uh, are proportionally always more important, and uh, in uh, shareholder socialism, uh, those capital incomes can be, to some extent, uh, make, made uh, more equal. Secondly, it would increase uh, participation in decision making, both in workplaces and in the political sphere. And um, um, it would lay the ground for a much more pluralistic market economy, one more attuned to the democratic uh, values of a, no, of a truly open uh, society. So that in this way, I think this uh, approach would substantially contribute to better satisfy our aspirations for a more humane, just, and efficient economic system. Thank you very much. Giacomo Corneo, uh, may I ask you to, uh, to have a chair here? Uh, thank you. You're, you're sitting there? OK, what you like. Uh, a certain distance between the... Um, thank you so much um, for presenting your uh, research on all different uh, economical systems throughout the ages, really from uh, Thomas More till uh, today. Um, as you say in the beginning, the utopia of Thomas More is in a way only uh, doable when you really have a severe, um, how you say, a severe um, uh, strategy on how the civilians really will add to the system to make sure there's no one opting out, no one is escaping the system. Um, is this something you see in China for today? Is that the utopia of Thomas More? Well, no, I, I think that uh, <clears throat> well, China is a modern, uh, modern version of an uh, authoritarian um, uh, regime in, uh, in which uh, the extent of uh, socialization of uh, uh, basic goods uh, is actually smaller than uh, we have now in Europe. So if you think about uh, access to tertiary education, uh, the health care system, and so on. So I think that we are uh, more socialist, if you like, uh, than, the, the, than the Chinese. Okay. But um, of course, uh, um, China offers uh, some interesting uh, insights because uh, it shows that uh, indeed uh, even a system without uh, uh, democratic competition uh, can develop uh, ways uh, to enforce some other form of, uh, of competition uh, that uh, allows for high performance in terms of economic growth. But uh, I, I think uh, this is not uh, something uh, that is uh, inspiring, uh, inspiring for us. So I think uh, we are more interested in a, in a truly humanistic uh, uh, perspective uh, that is uh, based in our uh, European uh, history. Well, let's dive into this, this new sort of blueprint you're presenting, this shareholder socialism, um, where you say uh, that the workers, in a way, own uh, the capital. Um, do you think this is possible to, to work with in a more global setting? Because we are living in a totally globalized world where the streams of capital are going around the globe. Do you think that this sort of blueprint is, is sustainable for this globalism? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think this is a, a very important uh, point, and it's also a reason why, in general, the ideas of um, market socialism and shareholder socialism in particular are ideas uh, that are uh, particularly relevant f for nowadays, because um, the key point uh, uh, for this, uh, in these uh, blueprints is that uh, you arrange a more egalitarian distribution of resources by interfering with the primary distribution of, in of capital incomes. Hmm? That is to say, you have uh, public ownership of an important share of the capital stock. And thanks to this public ownership, you are in a position that you can redistribute the returns from that capital to the population. And this is very different from the standard ways in which uh, the typical social market economies of Europe have contained inequality in the last 60 years, say, after the Second World War. How, how was it that uh, 
we managed to conjugate economic prosperity with social cohesion. Well, it was uh, thanks, uh, on the one hand, to, the, to various labor market institutions, like the trade unions. Wage bargaining uh, helped a large uh, fraction of the population to have uh, increasing uh, uh, income sta incomes and better li living standards, and then uh, progressive taxation and social policy. But uh, precisely, as, as you mentioned, uh, now we are in a globalized uh, situation in which uh, the workers uh, in uh, the rich countries uh, are uh, in competition uh, with much, much uh, uh, less, wor less earning uh, workers in the global uh, economy, and every country is in competition with every other country in terms of tax competition and the regulation of financial markets. Mm -hmm. So that those two key institutions, say collective wage bargaining and progressive taxation, well, they have reached their apex. They cannot do much more than what they do now. But if we want to preserve social cohesion, we then must look for different institutions. And the, the, but then the, the it way means that you need a world government. No, because uh, um, precisely even a, a country all alone can introduce the institutions uh, that are uh, demanded by market or shareholder socialism. So actually what I propose uh, as a concrete first step in this direction is the creation of uh, a, what I call uh, ethical uh, citizens' uh, uh, wealth fund or sovereign wealth fund. And in this, in this perspective, uh, we would have uh, an, an institution that can be created by a single country which uh, invests possibly worldwide in the stock market without achieving control of companies so that uh, public ownership of capital in this first step would uh, be passive. It would not control uh, the companies. It would only be a kind of collective rentier hmm, and would use uh, the returns from this investment uh, in order to finance uh, for instance, a social dividend. And this means that uh, you can do this uh, also without any international cooperation. Every country would be free to establish such an institution. Well, in the Netherlands, we already have a system but looks like a little bit about this idea. And these are the so-called pension funds, where all the workers put in money, and which is controlled by both uh, the, well, you can say the, the, the factory bosses and uh, representatives of uh, the unions, and they decide where to put the money in, where to invest in, and they got a lot of dividend. But there's always, interesting enough, uh, the question for more. All the participants in this fund say, yeah, we need more uh, percentages, we need more uh, return on our investment. Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, there are uh, uh, possible interesting developments starting from this experience. So as a rule, uh, once uh, you uh, think not in a romantic way, but in a pragmatic way about bettering uh, our economic system, you should always look at uh, what reality offers and try to understand whether the rather sophisticated institutions that have been successfully developed over time can be turned in order to deliver very really general benefits. Now, with respect to the particular institution that you mentioned, I think that there could be two basic uh, developments that would, uh, uh, that would make a difference. The first one is what uh, Alaska has been doing since the early 80s, namely to uh, uh, finance a social dividend out of the returns of uh, such a sovereign wealth fund. So in Alaska created uh, such a, called, it's called the Alaska Permanent Fund, already in the 70s, and then it was a Republican governor yeah, that uh, had the idea to uh, finance a social dividend out of it. And there was a referendum that uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, sanctioned this, uh, this change. So this would be one way of giving in a transparent, egalitarian way the proceeds from, from such a fund. And the second idea is what Norway has been doing for many years now, namely the idea to develop on a democratic basis a kind of ethical code that restricts 
investment so as to make it sure that these institutions behave in a way that is consistent with our values. So in Norway, in, the, in Norway it works like this, that uh, uh, the code is uh, rather precise. So for instance, uh, you should not invest uh, in uh, corporations that produce nuclear weapons or cluster munitions uh, or uh, generate severe uh, damages to the natural environment and so on. And uh, then there is a commission uh, of ethics that checks whether uh, the companies in which the Norwegian fund has invested have violated one of those norms. And if they did so, then the fund is uh, forced to sell those shares. Hmm? And this is not only just a way to express a collective identity and to say we stay for peace, we stay for human rights, we stay for natural environment sustainability, but it is also a, a way to make pressure on uh, the investors, on the corporations, on the multinational corporations, because uh, the Norwegian fund uh, is a pretty large one, hmm? so that uh, they have to think twice uh, before uh, violating uh, those norms. Yeah, because they have a big stake in a company, they really have a, a big seat on the table to negotiate about this sort of uh, ethic uh, elements. Yeah, well, the corporations know that uh, if they uh, violate uh, some of the requirements of the ethical code, then uh, uh, the fund is going to sell their shares, then uh, the share price will fall, then the, the income of the managers uh, will fall. Yeah. So this is a very simple, uh, very simple uh, mechanism. And uh, you can go to the home page of Norges Bank and you read all the names of the companies that have been excluded. So I think there are 90 or uh, 95 companies, so it's very transparent. Every citizen can, uh, can discuss about it in an open way. And is in this, let's say, committee of the, the fund, uh, are the workers represented? Is it democratically organized? Well, I think that in, in Norway it's uh, a commission of five uh, persons that have been appointed by the government uh, I think uh, uh, proposed by the parliament, but this is just uh, one possible way of doing this. Mm. So I think that uh, one can elaborate uh, uh, democratic uh, procedures so as to have, uh, uh, say, say, a regular check over the content of the ethical uh, code, and then uh, to have uh, some uh, democratic control over the persons who have to make this operational. So I think this is something which is feasible. Okay. I think you made a, a clear pledge for what you call public ownership of capital uh, into the 21st century economical system and how it exactly should be organized. Well, we have a, debated a little bit already, but we will debate it much further with our panel. Thank you so much for your introduction. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, the panel and uh, Giacomo is going to uh, to listen carefully what they are going to say and of course they uh, he will respond when necessary and of course after that I give the floor to uh, a lot of you uh, to ask questions. Um, Helene Mees, she is an opinion writer and author of four books. She is a columnist for the Volkskrant and the Project Syndicate. And in addition to her writing, she has been teaching in the New York University Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Helene Mees. Albert Jan Kuyter, he's a publicist and co-founder of the Institute for Publieke Waarde. The IPW develops new ways to realize accessible public and social care. And he thinks highly of our welfare state, but is not afraid to criticize and deconstruct bureaucracy. And last but not least, Lex Hoogduin, he is a professor of economics of complexity and uncertainty at the Rijksuniversiteit Groningen. Lex Hoogduin. Well, first of all, you uh, all have been uh, given the book and have been uh, read it carefully. Uh, Lex, may I start with you? Can you give an overall impression when you have, uh, have read it? Uh, <coughs> a very interesting, uh, fascinating uh, book. Uh, I've read it from the uh, perspective of a certain stream that we have in economics that have studied in the past uh, has compared different economic systems, uh, the so-called Neo-Austrian School of Economics, 
uh, with the well-known representatives of uh, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek. And they have looked in the past at, at, at different schools, uh, have analyzed uh, the different uh, economic uh, systems, and have reached uh, conclusions uh, for the part of uh, the, the first part of the book, where there's not yet the alternative, that are uh, completely in line with Giacomo's uh, conclusions, sometimes on, 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 on somewhat different, uh, different grounds. Uh, and that I found uh, fascinating. And uh, in a way, then, if you then read the rest of the book, where, let's say, uh, more, more collective elements enter the economic uh, system, the proposed, let's say, uh, remediation of the, of the, of the, uh, of the problems, uh, the, these are, let's say, collectivist elements. Uh, and these are heavily criticized by the in the Austrian uh, school. So, so you have a very interesting combination that you don't uh, often find in the economic uh, literature, where you have somebody who's very critical of people criticizing, uh, let's say, the, the, the neoliberal uh, order, but then at the end, <laughs> surprisingly, supposes something that goes in the other di uh, direction, and that I found Fascinating and also a bit, bit confusing, to be okay. honest. Mm -hmm. Well, we talk about that uh, that later. Alain Mays, um, Giacomo also states that it was a sort of a taboo to debate the idea of capitalism in the economics over the last 20, 30 years. Um, do you agree? Um, I don't think it's completely a taboo, but we really felt that capitalism had won. Uh, so there wasn't a reason. It's not maybe we didn't really study the uh, economic systems, but we practiced them. You know, we had uh, really uh, the social welfare state here in Europe. We had the more harsh market capitalism in America, and we had a centrally planned uh, economy in uh, China. And everybody can see what happened in China when they decided to let elements of capitalism uh, in into their uh, system and suddenly uh, economic growth uh, spiked and people just, you know, uh, got in in uh, maybe some people some people here in this uh, I would like I like to ask people here in 1990 uh, two thirds of all Chinese lived in deep poverty. Does anybody know here what in 2015? how many Chinese were still living in deep poverty, that's defined as $1.75 per year for local prices. Anybody a guess? So it was 67% uh, in 1990. Does anybody know what percentage of people living in deep poverty Chinese uh, in, in 2015 was? Any guess? It's one less than one percent right now. So if you want to see, like, does, is capitalism obsolete? Well, not for the Chinese, I would say. So that sort of marks your point, saying capitalism is working, especially for the Chinese over the last 15, 20 years or so. Um, um, but my question was, uh, is it a taboo to discuss other sort of structures in, in economics? And you say, well, there was simply no reason to do it. No, we had, we've practiced many, so I think, um, and what you see now, it's not a taboo at all, because there was a long waiting list to be here, and there were actually a lot of people, it was even sold on the market, uh, tickets for being here tonight, so I don't think it's a taboo at all. No, it has been but debated Albert very John, intensively in the 1920s and 1930s. Right, so it has been debated before. Yeah, it has been debated. Because that's, Albert Jan, I, I wanted to, to ask you, can you explain why so many people still have the feeling it's not going into the right direction with our system. It was debated in the 1920s and 30s when we were in big crisis uh, in, the, in the last century. Uh, but I think already mentioned, uh, half 50% uh, of the Germans have this feeling this system is not working for us anymore. Can you explain why? Uh, Giacomo, uh, it's told already, he has been thinking of utopias and blueprints. Uh, capitalism was never designed as a utopia or a blueprint. It basically evolved, like a democracy. And all systems that evolve, of course, have flaws. Um, but we are all raised and trained in universities that everything evolved from a blueprint. Capital who invented capitalism? 
When was it invented? When did we start this? I mean, it has always been there like democracy. Funny thing is, democracy has the same history as capitalism. Democracy is a crisis. Also, since the 90s, it has no natural en enemy. It's not in Western Europe. Um, it's not debated that heavily anymore. And, and what Giacomo does and what I relate to and what I like is he starts the conversation with capitalism is a problem and the solution, because it produces inequality, and the solution is even more capitalism and even more democracy. And they're both in crisis, so I'm very um, confused. I'm confused a little. So if capitalism and democracy are the problem, why is the solution more capitalism and more democracy and why should it produce a, a more equitable society? I mean, well, Lex, you could also point out that when you go back into, let's say, the late 70s, 80s, um, we were on the peak of the social democratic uh, approach of capitalism. Government was much more active, uh, was much broadened. There were more, more social systems active. Since then, a lot of has been cut down. Um, is that the sort of track Giacomo is, 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 is going back to, or is it really a new ID. First of all, I don't, I don't really think that after the 70s that we really have gone, uh, gone back. I, I do think that, that uh, the system that we are in is uh, what Giacomo calls uh, so social market uh, economy. I would call it neoliberalism. Uh, where neoliberalism, there's a lot of confusion about that, that term. Uh, I define neoliberalism as it was de uh, defined in 1938 by uh, Walter Liebman, who uh, wrote a book at that time. Uh, as, as I said earlier, there was a lot of discussion at that time about what is the right economic and political system. The idea was that the crisis in the 1930s had proven that, the, that capitalism didn't work uh, and that liberalism, pure liberalism, didn't uh, work. And then there was a stream of people, and Walter Liebman uh, is, is one of them, who wrote a book, The Great Society, where he defined what we now call what is the root of real neoliberalism, where he said that we need a functioning market system because it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's uh, leading to growth, uh, leading to efficiency uh, in, in the end, but a market is imperfect. It has all kinds of flaws, have all kinds of failures, and you have to correct those failures uh, via a, a, a government that intervenes in the in the economy. So, neoliberalism is a combination of liberalism, letting markets uh, work, and the neo part is interventionism from the uh, from the government. And and I, I would argue that that since the 1970s, that's that's the regime that we are uh, that we are in. Uh, although there has been deregulation, but. Uh, Look, for instance, at the Netherlands. If you look at uh, the, mar the market economy in the Netherlands, mention, uh, do, 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 try to think about one important market where there's no strong government influence. You mentioned it already, the, pen the pension sector, the banking, the banking sector, uh, uh, healthcare, education. It's all a combination. It's the type, the type of hybrid system that was referred to. So that's, that's, uh, okay. that's still the system. So, Helene Mays, if we, if we say there is still this sort of neoliberalism uh, in the market where the government is strong in, in regulation, there's one other problem I think a lot of people also here uh, gather to face, and that's the feeling that the system itself is not working on the bigger topics, like the 1% owning the biggest part of capital, uh, like the problem with uh, pollution, which cannot be solved on the national level but needs uh, to be solved on a global level. It, are these just, let's say, market imperfections where a strong government is the one to, to, to solve or...? Well, it's not really like about market uh, perfection or not. I think the problem is uh, capitalism works fine if you have a shortage of labor. Uh, so all our economic models that we have uh, is in, uh, the neoclassical synthesis uh, is in fact was uh, comes from a time when labor was in short supply, and that meant that every uh, time, that every year, if workers became more productive, they could really bargain for higher salaries with their uh, empl uh, employers. The problem now is that uh, I think uh, because of globalization and mostly because of uh, China's entry to the World Trade Organization in 2001, 
we've had such a huge shock to the system because China is 1.3 uh, billion people. Uh, India, which has not had the same effect, but is also 1.1 billion uh, people. So you have so many more competition in the labor market so that we are really, workers are out-competing, as Giacomo already said, out-competing each other. So who is, if the, if the, wage, if, if the workers cannot uh, uh, bargain extra salaries if they become more productive, who is the winner? The capitalist. So the system is not working fairly. Not as long, if there's not a shortage of labor, it's not working fairly, then it just uh, serves the capitalists. So then the question is, Albert Jan, can we just simply adjust the system to make it more fairly, or do we need, in a way, need a complete new sort of approach? Well, if you, we do need some sort of new approach, but the thing is, to isolate capitalism in a discussion is a funny thing to do. I mean, if you look at the Netherlands, for example, social exclusion and, and inequality and um, it's always been a function of markets, governments and civil society. And it's still the case today. So um, the people that are excluded, the working poor, uh, the people that are on uh, benefits, uh, poor children, uh, um, they're excluded by government, by bureaucracy. Uh, they're excluded by the market system because they're not profitable. They're excluded by the network society, we all, because they are not profitable to our networks. So it's not only the market system that excludes people, it's governments and society as well. Mm -hmm. So we can blame the markets for everything, um, but it's time we look in the mirror as well and, and, and not give government all uh, options and, and resources to produce equality. So do you think that the idea of Giacomo, who says, I'm looking for a more humanistic approach, yeah. that this can be the answer? Of course, because neoliberalism uh, may be efficient, but it's not profitable. So what we uh, at the Institute for Public Values basically do, we use market mechanisms to produce social inclusion. So it's actually quite easy to calculate the costs of social exclusion and make a business case out of it and tell local communities, city halls and government that it's a, a wrong way of investment. It doesn't produce anything. So what we basically do, if I give, can give one example. Yeah, um, well, this year we talked to a woman. She was on benefits. She had five children. She was indebted to the housing corporation for 2,200 euros. So the housing corpora corporation would kick her out of the house. That would mean she would go into a, a shelter. That's 100 euros a day, mind you, uh, for three months. That's 9,000 euros. Her five children would be put to uh, uh, childcare. That's 13,000 euros a child. So we as taxpayers would pay 74,000 euros because she had 2,200 euro debt with the housing corporation. So what does my institute do? We pay for the 2,200 euros. We save 72,000 euros with, well, we can produce more social inclusion. So in the city of The Hague, we do this for 250 families. And the business case is we spend 1.4 million euros. And but they cost, structurally cost 5.7 million now. And they're more happy with the results. So you can make a business case yeah. by being really capitalistic about social inclusion. It sounds promising. It sounds very important for the people concerned. Uh, and it also sounds that you can do this in the system. Definitely. So you don't need a big social change or economical change whatsoever. No, no you have to teach uh, uh, capitalism to be just and capitalistic. Just what it promises to do, and neoliberalism to be profitable in the public domain, but it does never do automatically. Lex, it seems that this is the sort of micro-governmental management which can help solving problems. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I, I want to go back a little bit to the earlier, let's say, conclusion that you uh, started to uh, to draw that the, the system doesn't uh, doesn't work. I don't. I don't. I don't agree. I don't, I don't agree. Uh, again, Elaine mentioned the example of China, but if you take a, a broader uh, picture over the past two, uh, two centuries, and uh, look how much uh, welfare has been created, uh, how much, uh, let's say, the life expectancy 
has increased. Uh, over, over, those, uh, over those years, it's really a puzzle. The tremendous successes on, on every level. I, 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 would, I would argue if you, you compare, let's say, somebody at, at, at a minimum wage in the Netherlands uh, at the moment, compared to availability of uh, goods and services, uh, electricity and so on, to, to somebody who was very rich at the end of the 19th century, uh, the, the, the person on the minimum wage now is So then, is then again, the question also for you, is it just imperfections we're talking about? The fact that 1% owns so much, the fact that there, there is social exclusion, the fact that we have the pollution not going to be tackled? I, I think the, 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 problem, the, the, the problem is that we uh, think that we can uh, engineer a financial uh, or an economic system like we can engineer, uh, let's say, uh, nature, uh, building bridges, uh, developing buildings. So uh, what in Dutch is called the maakbaarheid mm -hmm. van de samenleving. So, so that you can, so, uh, central planning is, is the extreme example, uh, example of that. And I think what we cannot accept is uh, what I would call the human condition. Uh, we do not live in paradise, and we cannot live in paradise. There are a couple of things that we cannot uh, cannot avoid. Uh, so we are mortal. We cannot know the we cannot know the future. We are born unequal. Uh, inequality is the is the human uh, condition, and not uh, equality. And we try to engineer ourselves in uh, equality, uh, going back. Let's say to the early literature that I uh, that I uh, refer to. That, that literature came, came to the conclusion, not only that, let's say, that central planning cannot, uh, cannot work, but that the best possible uh, system that we have stumbled upon, not designed, as uh, Albert Jan uh, explained, is classical capitalism. And what we, we are in now is Okay, is I, new, I, is I give you that. I mean, we are, we are, and that's we're, a we're, we're humble human beings with all that <laughs> comes, uh, what you just mentioned, but then still, Helene, brings this so-called idea of the, 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 the public-owned state fund paradise a little bit closer? Is that a, is that a solution? Well, I love the idea. So uh, when I read about it, it's really like how you want society to be. And, you know, if all people were as lovely as your daughter, um, yeah, then probably it would work. But it, it really, uh, the... the um, assumption for the uh, sovereign wealth fund, social wealth, uh, wealth fund, uh, is really that people share the same ideals and the same uh, vision for what is good for the planet or not, or what is good for them. And um, I live in the United States, and in your book you also, um, you know, you give an example how much it would do to alleviate poverty in the United States. I think it would bring it back people in, living in poverty, poverty from 9% to 6% of the population. Um, and uh, of course, that would be um, a very good idea. The only thing is um, we are, have elections coming up. We don't have a nicely, co you know, consistent coherent vision for the future. Coherent, yeah. uh, vision for the future. It's, yeah. it's, these are very harsh, hard times. So you see that as one of the problems that there is not a majority of the people facing one sort of direction. Albert Jan, what do you think of the idea of this so-called public fund? Democracy was invented because we, the people, never agree. Um, and democracy was not invented to be uh, efficient or effective, but on the contrary, it was invented to be counterproductive to accumulation of power. To make sure not one sort of full gaps Absolutely. everything. Yeah, yeah. So, some people say democracy is not efficient. That was exactly what it was needed for, mm -hmm. because we separated powers, right? And, and, and we did that because we never agree. So I, I, I do agree with mm -hmm. Elaine. Um, you will have the same sort of problems with this fund. So let's have an example. BMW, you use it in your book. Let's say the fund knows they fraud with climate stuff in cars, right? But it will give an extra profit of two billion. And with that two billion, we can get rid of poverty with children. What would the fund decide? These are the questions that a fund has to decide. Where do we agree on? So you can write an, an ethical writer or whatever, but these are real problems in the public domain. This is debate which our Dutch pension funds have every day, I think. 
Yes. Yeah. And you cannot get rid of it with a rider. You have to keep debating it. Yeah. And, and the longer democracy in the Netherlands exists, the less and less we agree. Mm -hmm. So it would be a nice experience, experience but I wouldn't put 50% of our cross domestic product in it directly. Okay, Lex, what do you think of the idea? Yeah, I, I, th I think, uh, my, my diagnosis is, I, I have no time to, to really elaborate, but that, that uh, the flaws uh, in neo-liberalism uh, are in the neo part and not in the liberalism part. And I think that uh, the, uh, the establishment uh, of such a fund, sympathetic, uh, the idea uh, and the objectives behind it may, may be, would would uh, probably intensify the flaws that I see in the in the uh, neo uh, liberalism, uh, which which is basically that uh, you get a combination of you you do not get the the uh, full scale participation uh, people people okay. uh, don't don't start to to intervene. What you get uh, and what you already uh, see now is a combination of on the one hand crony capitalism where the big uh, companies start to influence the government by the government. Uh, and I, I don't believe in a kind of an independence uh, like the European well, Central Bank, but even the European yes, Central Bank has cor been corrupted. And the other side is that there's a kind of a tug of war between the government on the one hand, uh, where the government also wants to impose so-called social objectives on, uh, on, on, on the market companies. And so what you get is an interventionistic Crony, uh, crony state, uh, where in the end uh, the functioning of both parts is, is hampered uh, with shortages, uh, lower growth, inefficiencies. Okay, thank you. It's, it's the unintended outcome, I I'm afraid. Well, they like your ideas. They are a little bit puzzled <laughs> <laughs> of some of your uh, conclusions. And the underline is we don't trust ourselves as human beings, so don't trust this sort of fund. Yeah, uh, well... <laughs> First of all, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, so many thoughtful uh, remarks. Uh, I would like to uh, just uh, make uh, clear what the philosophy behind uh, my approach is. So, uh, of course, um, capitalism uh, is a system that uh, has evolved uh, over time on a decentralized uh, level. So, but uh, basically, when you think about uh, uh, possible uh, improvement in our uh, social um, uh, institutions, you can approach the problem at three levels. There is the micro level, there is the macro level, and there is the meso level. So at the micro level, uh, then there are institutions or uh, institutes like the ones that uh, Albert Chan uh, has uh, founded. And uh, here uh, I think that uh, practical experimentation uh, is the best device in order to understand what works in practice and what not. Uh, so uh, that uh, one should try and then, uh, well, Experience will show what, uh, what is good for, for society. Then there is uh, the macro level. And uh, here, this is the critique uh, that uh, uh, you, uh, you uh, uh, considered, uh, and uh, which is uh, a main point of uh, the Austrian school, and uh, uh, Popper uh, wrote a lot about it, which is indeed that uh, you cannot conceive uh, of a, a whole complex economic system as a, a, an artwork that you can design from scratch. And, uh, and I think that indeed things are much too complex at that macro level in order to be designed. So. But then there is the meso level. The meso level is the level of institution building. And uh, this is a level in which it is uh, very difficult because there is no spontaneous decentralized mechanism that creates something new. There must be some uh, political uh, force, some collective elements that brings them about. And uh, sometimes they are extremely successful. Think of uh, social security created by Bismarck uh, in uh, the 90, at the end of the 19th century. How much it improved the welfare for so big layers of the population. Think of the New Deal of Roosevelt. Hmm? These were processes of institutional, institutional building that was, were not spontaneous mechanisms that just evolved. No? There was some, some uh, collective will to try. Hmm? And this is exactly the spirit which I take. Because I think that uh, after that Fukuyama said that the history is uh, to the end and uh, there is no alternative and so on, then we thought, yes, everything is spontaneous. No, it's not. And uh, we, we have been uh, uh, used to, uh, up to a great 
economic growth and the social prosperity over 60 years of Europe? Yes, but under the conditions that you mentioned before. We are not anymore in those conditions. And if we have some structural change, then if we do nothing, then we are going to, okay. to, to, uh, to have the same experience as the United States over the last 30, 40 years. And we do not want to have a Trump that is ruling Europe in, uh, in the next year. So, <laughs> okay, point. You, you stay behind this microphone, and I'd like to give some people the possibility uh, to ask questions. Maybe both to the panel and to you. So you all have a mic if you want to respond. Who wants to, uh, to ask a question or uh, to elaborate on some of the issues we have been uh, discussing? And a question is a question. Eh? It's not since 1986 and then the whole uh, riddle. No, straight <laughs> focus. Okay, yeah? You uh, open the ball, yeah? Okay, okay. <laughs> ja, ik kom met je met de mic. Mag ik er even? Ja, een beetje wel. Oké, okay. go ahead. Thanks. Um, how would you fund the sovereign wealth fund? Would it be funded by taxation or out of corporations or personal income tax? Or yeah. How would you fund it? That's, that's a key issue. So, barring uh, the lucky discovery of some uh, oil reserves or, or natural resources, I think uh, there are plenty of uh, possible financial uh, financing uh, sources. I think that uh, for countries like the Netherlands uh, or, uh, or Germany, the two more most interesting ones are the emission of uh, long-term inflation indexed uh, public debt and uh, the use of uh, revenue from inheritance taxes. So inheritance taxes uh, are quite interesting because uh, the tax base is predicted to be growing more uh, rapidly than a GDP over the next years. Uh, inheritances are very concentrated so that you can generate very progressive uh, effects by taxing them uh, properly. The incentive, the disincentive effects are quite moderate. Some people even think that uh, taxing inheritances can uh, prompt more economic growth. And uh, by definition, it hits uh, wealth that has not been created by the taxpayer, so that it is uh, very much in line with our uh, meritocratic values. And public debt is very interesting because nowadays uh, the real interest rate on safe assets is uh, zero or even negative, whereas um, returns on, on the stock market uh, are uh, on average by at 7%. Uh, and um, in this way, uh, by emitting this public debt, uh, you could uh, finance, I think, uh, the largest part of and such I, a sovereign Is that a good fund. idea to fund it from public debt or uh, from uh, well? Uh, I love the idea of extra taxation, especially in the United States. But there, uh, Donald Trump just, uh, the president just uh, abolished the death tax. Um, and I would think, you know, isn't there a problem in a liberal society that there is only so much you can, you know, force people to pay taxes? Uh, for uh, example, people in Silicon Valley, the people with the, billion, uh, the billionaires, they're always very much in favor of a basis income. But those are the same people who put all their money away in charities, which are actually just black boxes, which they don't use to actually finance charity, but just to avoid taxation. I, you know, I think there's a uh, real tension. So I, yeah. while I love the idea, I'm not so sure what it's Alex, what do you think about it? I hate the idea. <laughs> to be to be uh, to be clear, I, I, in the first place, I do think that the, the current low interest rate is artificial. Uh, so it basically means that there is a slow expropriation of savers, and savers are not only rich people; are people that are build, building, ordinary people that are building their pensions of are uh, retired. So basically, what you do is you you uh, you expropriate. Uh, a large part of the of the population. Uh, that's what's, what's going on at uh, at the moment. Borrowing uh, the money will shift. Uh, let's say uh, by uh, uh, paying for it to the uh, to the to the future. So I don't think it's a it's a good idea at all. You don't create the wealth. You shift it from one to the uh, mm -hmm. to the other. Giacomo, maybe just to elaborate on this issue, the fact that this fund is going to finance all sort of um, uh, investments in companies and so on. What if this fund isn't so successful? What if it is negative in the, in the end? Who is paying the price? Well, <clears throat> of course, such an institution uh, would um, 
undertake some collective uh, risk. So um, I do not think that uh, the current uh, level of interest rate uh, is uh, a manipulation of some uh, conspirative group. Actually, we observe uh, since the early 80s a downward trend in real uh, interest rates, and uh, there are a very uh, a clearly empirically investigated uh, demographic uh, evolutions uh, worldwide and also technological developments that suggest that indeed uh, uh, such uh, a low level of uh, real interest rate is uh, quite uh, uh, some, something that is uh, naturally brought about and is going to, to last uh, for a while. So, for instance, the old middle class, the old new middle classes in China and India, you know, they are much poorer than our middle classes. And since risk aversion is falling with income, they would like to have safe assets to uh, uh, prepare for retirement, to finance uh, at university for their children, for their health, health and care problems. So, so that there's there is not, not a problem there, Alex. The, 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 this, this what Giacomo is describing now is indeed is one of the theories uh, about, let's say, interest rate uh, developments uh, and what explains the low, the low, low interest uh, rate. I don't buy, buy that uh, theory, that it is empirically tested, says nothing, uh, because you cannot measure uh, an equilibrium uh, interest rate. That's an unabsorbable, no. uh, unabsorbable uh, thing. The alternative theory says that this has been, uh, this is a long-term process that started in the early 70s where uh, we went off the gold, uh, the gold, uh, the, 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 not the gold standard, but the, the, the IMF uh, rules that after that we have had a long uh, asymmetric uh, monetary policy where interest rates were reduced step by step, by step and are now indeed at an artificially low, uh, low level. At a level which, which is totally implausible if you see uh, what the growth at the moment is, uh, is around 3%, having negative interest rate at a, at a period where they have so, so strong growth and where there is okay, so hardly any unemployment more. So, to so, that's, so, so yeah. again, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't part. buy that part of the story. Another thing on the... Okay, one response of Jack. Yeah. 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 Uh, may, may I also then respond after that on the, on the, uh, the, the yeah. return on equity? Step by step. So first is... Well, you asked about uh, the issue of uh, uh, stock market crashes and so on. Well, <clears throat> the idea is that... Uh, uh, the sovereign wealth fund would not finance this social dividend every year from uh, the net returns of the sovereign wealth fund. It, in periods of uh, super normal profits, it would build a buffer stock. For instance, it would uh, buy back uh, public debt that then would be sold in periods of uh, stock market crashes in order to smooth the payment of the social dividend. So in Alaska, for instance, they do this very in a very simple way, they just pay out the average return over the last five years. This is a quite crude uh, uh, method, but it is already a way to smooth. But there are much better methods that are available. Okay. Leonard, Leonard sorry. Can, John, I, yeah, can, can I just, in, input aside, I understand. We can, we can borrow $10 billion somewhere and we just invest it in the fund. But what about the output? Because you said you want to produce a humane and equal society. If you give everybody in this room a social dividend of 2,000 euros a year, that's not equality. That's creating inequality. Why not give the poor 10,000 and the rich ones 1,000? That's social dividend if you want to solve inequality. So what about the outside part of the return on investment from the fund? The social dividend, why not differentiate okay, between yeah. different Gentlemen? incomes? Yeah. No, I think this is a very, it's a very fair point. Uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, I think that uh, if uh, we could uh, think that uh, the government is behaving fairly and efficiently, then indeed it would be better to say, well, we do not uh, pre-commit uh, in any way, we do not earmark in any way the returns of such an institution, and the government would use it, for instance, uh, for social policy or for other. But the problem is that... Uh, uh, for instance, uh, in Italy, but also in other countries, sometimes incompetent and opportunistic people come to power. And then they have uh, the incentive maybe to, uh, say, uh, use uh, the assets of the fund to just finance pork barrels or to finance uh, just clientelistic uh, campaigns and so on. If you have a social dividend, this increases the saliency of the institution and makes it like a basic right so that the po politically it becomes very costly.
for an opportunistic government to behave in such an opportunistic way. And so I think uh, that uh, as a, a precautionary method, okay. I, would, uh, I would favor, because I do not trust government Last so much. Last response mm -hmm. from Lex, and then I give someone else the yeah, floor. I'd like question. to make two, two, two points. One, one, one is a, uh, on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the front again. Isn't it a big hedge fund that you're uh, set, setting up? Uh, because you, you refer to the equity return, so you calculate uh, that you will have a higher return than this artificially low uh, re return on, uh, on public uh, debt. Don't you uh, make a mistake uh, that you exclude the companies that will go bankrupt and that you don't have in your, your, your average uh, return? So you, ha you have selection, survival bias. Se second point is a uh, different point. Why making it uh, it's so difficult? Why not, if you want to borrow that money, why don't you give it to e each individual so that each individual can decide him or herself in which company to invest and uh, what, what objectives to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to try to achieve? Because if, if I get this 10,000 uh, euro, I may want to invest it in companies that, that are very good at uh, X. Let's in this collective decision-making mechanism, yeah. I have no, no say at all. Is so this the next step to lowering taxes? Or, um, yeah, come on, please. That would be yeah. the same so, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So with respect to the magnitude of equity risk premium, I, I trust the experts on this field. With respect to the second uh, point that you made, well, <clears throat> uh, actually, why do we have uh, social security systems? Because uh, experience has shown that uh, a large part of the population cannot, or is not able to prepare in a rational way for retirement, so that mandatory savings can be helpful for them. And this is the reason why Social Security is, has been such a successful institution that has been adopted everywhere, and emerging economies are installing their own Social Security system. And the same is true for the sovereign wealth fund. So exactly as uh, worker households sometimes are not able to prepare for retirement exactly for the same reasons they are not able to optimally diversify in their portfolios. And indeed, in the, in the finance research, there is a big puzzle which is called the participation puzzle huh? because a lot of households fail to participate in markets for risky assets, although from an efficiency point of view they should do this. Huh? The sovereign wealth fund would, so to speak, be their collective portfolio manager. So yeah, but people don't have, no, no, no. lives are too short okay, for questions. everybody of us yep. to run after the stock Giacomo, market. Giacomo, we have another question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, as you already mentioned, the uh, uh, search for alternatives to capitalism are not in the mainstream political and scientific debates. How do you think the political debates about alternatives can be opened? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, that um, some, something like uh, the event that uh, we are uh, experiencing now is helpful in order to make these ideas uh, more uh, uh, popular and uh, uh, accustom people uh, to these uh, ideas, which are pretty new because, uh, as it was mentioned before, in a way I am, uh, I am suggesting, uh, <laughs> I think you th said more capitalism because I'm proposing the stock market. Hmm? But, uh, uh, I, again, this is something uh, which is not new from an historical point of view. That is the fact that one finds inspiration in the institutions that uh, at one point in time have been the most successful and most sophisticated ones. Take, for instance, uh, Franciscans. So you can hardly think that Franciscans are capitalistic uh, people. No? But still, Franciscans who were very interested in the welfare of the poor were those who, in the mid of the 15th century in Italy, established the pound, show, shop, pound shops. Pound shops were Montespietatis, yeah, where uh, people, every, everyone could uh, bring their items there, their small assets, and get a uh, credit so that uh, it would not become the victim of some, uh, um, some, uh, spec some uh, credit givers. Huh? And uh, those uh, pawn, sh pawn shops have developed then uh, into uh, so-called uh, public uh, local banks, Sparkassen or the Caisse d'Epargne, Caisse d'Espargne, who 
helped a lot of savers to create small wealth levels and small entrepreneurs to open their firms and so on. But the inspiration for the pawn shops were the big banks that thrived in Genoa and Venice and there were the capitalistic institutions of that time. So that you can transform a capitalistic institution into a progressive one. So in a way, another example of a, mi a micro uh, in in the initiative becoming on the mezzo level very effective. Yeah. yeah, so the answer would be start a micro initiative. <laughs> do something instead of trying to morally get something on the agenda. So doing something always works better in my experience. So we helped three people that were in healthcare institutions and lived there at the cost of 50,000 euros a year because there were no houses in this city available for them. So they stayed in the healthcare institution. Now we calculated that that is the case for 6,500 people in the Netherlands at a cost of 230 million euros a year. If you give that to housing corporations, they can build up an investment reserve of 8.3 million billion dollars and they can build 57,000 houses for this 6,500 people. And this has right. been doing, done now? We discussed it with the house, discussed yeah. this with the housing corporations right now, but we only started with three people. Yeah. So if you start at a micro level, you can ex okay. expand it to start a national level. Start on the practical level. Uh, last question. Who? Okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe two. Yeah. <laughs> How would you uh, define the values of such fund in a dramatic, uh, democratic way, or uh, should it be done by experts on human rights? Well, I think um, this is something that uh, should, um, should be discussed uh, at the basis of society, maybe uh, in, uh, local, uh, um, in local assemblies, and then uh, uh, the results of those discussions could be, could be given to uh, representatives that would uh, bring it uh, to the parliament, and uh, then uh, the parliament uh, would uh, produce such a charter or such a code. I think this could be one possibility. Okay, thanks. Last question. Okay. You okay? Okay. Giacomo, first of all, thank you so much for uh, being here and present uh, your work and all your ideas. I think we have learned quite a lot about the fact that the capitalism system wasn't a blueprint, but developed like democracy has been said, and that in those developments still adjustments can be made. Maybe a fund is a good idea. But I think we also learned don't trust blueprints and don't, don't trust uh, the, human, uh, the human kind. <laughs> um, people who still believe that capitalism is obsolete. Have they seen a turning point or, well, there's still six or seven now. These are the hardcore believers. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, the panel. Give them all a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.